Okay, so today uh, we're covering these three topics. Uh, first, we're going to cover uh, dealing with anxiety attacks, PTSD, and flashbacks. This is what we were originally going to cover day one, but we didn't have time, so we're going to cover it today. Then we're going to talk about self-care, communal care, and creating pods for supporting ourselves. And then finally, we're going to talk about kind of creating a self-defense plan. There will be a little bit of punching and yelling if you feel uh, if you want to um, participate, but uh, you do you do not have to. But we will be trying to reframe self-defense differently from kind of a less ableist perspective. Okay. So uh, again, we will. This is kind of the agenda for the day. First, we will talk about anxiety, PTSD. Then we'll have a break. Then we'll talk about self-care and communal care with a break in between. And then we'll end with self-defense and some time for evaluations at the end. Okay. So um, just to say kind of how this came about is that uh, what you're seeing today isn't just from what we did, but this has been a collective process of many, many people putting this together, kind of sharing their collective wisdom. Uh, so this isn't being framed as like experts per se, but it's the expertise of community wisdom of people who have been engaging in these issues. Um, but in that spirit, we welcome you to uh, share your expertise as we kind of collectively uh, go forward. And I'm going to put the uh, crowdsource document that we've been creating from the beginning right now. And if you have questions or thoughts or other expertise to, and if you go to the very end, you see day four, and we'll kind of rearrange that and resend it out so it looks a little polished and organized at the end. So Cat911, just to uh, briefly um, summarize, it's a network of people from various teams uh, that are trying to create alternatives to 911, both in creating new care systems. Um, and also creating rapid response systems. So this is part of helping to create a locally based rapid response uh, teams that are able to address crises without having to rely on 911. Um, and so uh, our kind of approach to this is that we cannot depend on criminal justice system because they usually make things worse. But in addition to that, even if they weren't problematic, uh, there's nothing that can care for communities better than communities. So how do we invest that knowledge in communities so that we who are right there are best able to respond in a crisis, but also how can we create different communities that have less crises in the first place? Okay. Um, so uh, to give you a little information on our local teams and sectors, if you're interested in joining, these are some of the teams that exist. So if you email us at cat911team at gmail.com. I'll put that in the uh, uh, chat and you can find more information about particular teams. And we also have sectors that help support these teams. Like this is part of the rapid response team that helps teams create rapid response systems, but we also have um, teams around sexual assault, domestic violence, colleges, university, K through 12, street medic trainings, et cetera. And if you're interested in something that doesn't exist yet, let us know we're open to suggestion. And also each of these groups operate autonomously so we don't pursue a one size fits all approach to this work. Uh, uh, San Diego, we do not yet, but if you're interested in San Diego, <laughs> please send, because I think we, we may be developing a critical mass soon and we can see what support we can provide. Okay, so um, again, kind of the approach from our abolitionist perspective here is that abolition isn't primarily a negative project, just getting rid of things. It's actually creating new societies and new communities of care that make different things possible such that policing and prisons would be irrelevant. But this isn't just about creating different systems around police specifically, but carceral systems, generally speaking. So. For instance, we talk about mental health, people can be incarcerated, not just by the police, but through psychiatric care, et cetera. Or there can be uh, carceral systems around trial protective services, et cetera. So we, we're seeking to provide a framework that's also not based on the hyper-professionalization of mental health, um, but centers the autonomy of people needing support. 
So again, as a result of that, we're not trying to present ourselves as the experts, but providing a space for collective learning and sharing. Um, so again, we went to the schedule for today. Um, just to let you know, we do have a wellness room. So if you're interested in that, you just send a direct message to me <laughs> and uh, I will give you the instructions for how to access the wellness room. And there will be somebody there uh, that uh, you can talk with in the wellness room. And I just put the crowdsource document here, but since we may, if we don't have a chance to get through all questions and anything, we, uh, we'll, we're creating this, we'll put stuff from the chat into the crowdsource document, but you can also put stuff directly into that uh, training to share your ideas or questions or things you're wondering about, share resources, anything of that nature. And again, this document will be available after the training. And we also have other crowdsource documents that have been created throughout this training. So we'll have links to all of those crowdsource documents afterwards. Okay, so with that, I will turn it over to Cindy. He will be facilitating our next section. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cindy. I go by the pronouns she, her. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on our last day of training. Today we will start with anxiety, particularly panic attacks, PTSD flashbacks, and focusing on the grounding techniques of the first responders. So we will cover some principles, go over some PTSD experiences, flashbacks, and the healing process, and get into grounding techniques. As a warning, um, during the following presentation, we will be talking about panic attacks, anxiety attacks, PTSD, and basic strategies to help cope. Um, just as a reminder, we have a wellness room. If anyone would like to join, please let CAT911 know, and um, they'll they'll guide you to that. Hey, also, Cindy, we can only see the top half of the training of the slide. Is that better? Yeah. All right. So today we will not be focusing on heart attacks, but because anxiety and panic attacks have so many similar characteristics to a heart attack, here's a list that we um, put together for you to start fam familiarizing yourself with some of the characteristics of these attacks. Um, primarily being aware of medical history, you know, cardiovascular issues and stressors um, and context clues are a starting point to better understand what type of attack you might be feeling or what, what you're going through, whether it's a heart attack or anxiety or panic. Um, understanding, you know, because there are many variables possible and so many people do not have access to an effective system that offers emergency medical help without the involvement of police. We won't shame anyone for calling 911 to access emergency medical assistance. We don't promote it, but we understand that this, sometimes this is the only route some people might have. If anyone has further information, please drop it in the chat or in the crowdsource link that for access to, if you wanna get around not having to call 911. So, um, in the crowdsource link. Additionally, CAT911 offers street medic training. So please email, you know, CAT911 if you want to join the street medic or learn a little bit more so you can learn about the more in-depth differences. Um, when dealing with anxiety, it can commonly happen out of nowhere. So panic attacks commonly get set off when you are in an extremely stressful or anxious situation. People sometimes normalize these stressful and anxiety moments, but that does not mean it's an ideal condition to be in. So suffering a panic attack out of nowhere, you know, is usually not out of nowhere. We just haven't pinpointed all the stressors we have around us or in us. As a responder, it is extremely important to keep this in mind because about 30% of all our first responders suffer from anxiety and PTSD, among other things. So, you know, go check out the list and go, keep going. 
so when when someone is in extreme distress they can go they can get so overwhelmed by their emotions that their brain stops processing information or feelings or emotions these experiences are internalized in an attempt to protect the person at the moment of stress but can later try to come out in the form of flashbacks anxiety attacks and or panic attacks these are generally brought on by someone focusing on something that happened in the past and or something that they fear will happen in the future post traumatic stress disorder or ptsd is a type of anxiety that results from a severe trauma causing extreme attacks People with PTSD experience PTSD in so many various ways. So it is important that people learn to recognize how anxiety presents itself to each of us. If we can practice recognizing when these moments start, then we can better address them when they're starting. Some ways PTSD can present itself to you are through flashbacks, persistent frightening thoughts, memories of the event, hyperarousal that causes sleep disturbance, irritability, and startling easily. Um, feelings of emptiness, avoidance that shows up as detachment, isolation, motion of numbing, and like that feeling of that you just can't be happy. As responders, the goal is to first and foremost de-escalate the person's distress to the point where the mind, which then helps the body, can stop experiencing the emotion or event as intensity. And that way they can try to regulate their emotions. We want the person in crisis to focus on what is happening right now by interrupting this spiral of thoughts that they're going into, you know, and fears and grounding them on what's happening right now. So to, in order to ultimately separate their emotions from their thoughts. Flashbacks in particular are a form of disassociation associated with PTSD, in which a person can physically experience a panic attack and relive the traumatic moment. They occur when something in the present triggers a memory of the traumatic event, and everyone has their particular triggers in relations to any of the senses, like sense, sights, um, things you hear, and so on. This floods the autonomic system, which is like your physical system, which increases the heart rate and respiratory rate. This is where your fight and flight reactions come from. So your body's adrenaline and cortisol then spikes up which brings the intensity of the trauma from the past back to right now. So regardless if at the present moment, someone is in a safe space and is physically safe, you know, the survivor will re-experience the event, believing both physically and mentally that the trauma is happening in real time right now. The intensity of the flashbacks depend on many factors of the person that's suffering the flashbacks. It also the, depends on the complexity of the PTSD and intensity of the triggers that they're going through. Many times it can be frustrating to not be able to stop the flashbacks or not be able to manage your memories. But sometimes it can be helpful to let people know that flashbacks and other experiences of PTSD can be a part of the healing process. When a person first undergoes a trauma, their mind cannot process the situation. So remember, it blocks it and to protect itself and the brain. And that may block a memory from their mind without processing it at the moment. Feelings from the trauma come back when that person is in a safer space. You know, a person might at that moment feel like they're going backwards because all these flashbacks and attacks are surging. But in reality, it can be a sign that they are now in the moment that they're at the moment, be able to begin processing that trauma.
So practicing some grounding techniques that can put into action, that you can put into action when these flashbacks, panic attacks, moments of anxiety and kick in is a great way to be prepared to better handle the, these moments and prevent them from getting worse. So again, you know, blocking that spiral of thoughts from as, as early as possible. So we are gonna get into some grounding techniques and because of, um, and just as a warning, we will be sharing a few grounding techniques and depending on your ability, some of the following grounding techniques that will be shared might be more or less accessible to some. So grounding techniques help people interrupt the spiraling thoughts and can get you to focus on what is happening right now, which is the goal when helping someone suffering from the attack. Because the triggers of the attacks are usually activated through the senses. The senses, we use the senses to instead focus on something else. And that is super helpful. So here are some ideas, you know, like, um, Smell. Smell is the strongest and most effective grounding to, um, intervention apart from ice dives, but ice dives aren't so accessible. So a scent that is soothing or unpleasant enough to snap you out of your thoughts, you know, can help you ground yourself and bring you back like essential oils or even hand sanitizers. You know, sounds continuously talking or sometimes, you know, you'll start clapping just can help people keep them in the present. And also be aware of their hearing volume because sometimes if panic attacks go too far, you can pass out or faint. And if you can focus on a sound, you'll start hearing the volume down as you start fainting. And that can give you a warning to say, you know what, let me drop to the floor instead of like falling and putting yourself in additional danger. Touch. Um, putting body in cold water and ice is the number one, obviously, but is not accessible and just be cautious with it because, you know, hypothermia and so on. But frozen bags of vegetables against your wrist, your face, your neck can also help you focus on the shock of the coldness and help um, people snap out of it. Um, focusing on the taste of something sour or sweet can help you keep grounded. Depending on the situation, obviously be cautious with choking hazards. Um, sights, pick an item to focus on and describe it in detail. For example, what color is it? What kind of soles the shoes have? Does it have laces? And you just keep describing as long as possible until you deescalate or you're not focused in that traumatic um, memory. So feel free to snap a picture of the, these techniques, you know, um, pictures or images. And um, we did want to demonstrate, you know, um, a grounding technique of five, four, three, two, one. Um, if I don't know if Andy or I could probably do it. Let me see. I'm here. Oh, okay. So we're going to start off and everybody, I guess, if possible, you can follow with Andy as well. We're going to do, we grab our hand and, you know, we just like put it in our chest or, you know, on your heart and we take a deep, deep breath through, our, you know, our nose release. And let's say Andy is going through a moment of anxiety or, you know, panic or a flashback. And then I would just be like, um, Andy, can you focus on five colors you see? Or if you're doing it for yourself, you know, just breathe and look around you, look around your room right now. And Andy, do you see any colors? Um, uh, I see uh, a black computer. I see um, my purple shirt. I see a white door, I see a black lamp, and uh, uh, I see red on the computer screen. And remember just 
keep breathing, you can keep your hand on your chest, just feeling that. And, you know, can you feel, let's say, the surface of some things, of forcing? Um, I feel uh, the smoothness of the computer, and I feel like cotton on my shirt, and I can feel my skin, and I can feel my hair. Okay, can we, uh, uh, do you hear anything? Like maybe acknowledging things that we hear at the moment? I can hear your voice. I can hear my voice and I can kind of hear some buzz from the lamp. And take a deep breath, you know. Uh, do you smell, Is there, are there any scents in the air that stand out for you right now? Um. I can I smell my skin, the soap from my skin, and um, I just smell some kind of spaghetti from my meal. And you just keep breathing. And is there something that you can taste right now? Is there anything? I can kind of still taste some spaghetti in my mouth from when I ate. Okay. And you know, sometimes you're not around anything and you can even, well, I mean, COVID right now, but if you're in, you know, at home or something, even licking yourself will be, you know, like, okay, you know, what is something just to focus on through your senses. Good job. Thank you, Andy. And other techniques, other grounding techniques include um, breathing, you know, you could Breathe, hold in for three, release for three. Keep repeating, repeat as often. Um, short bursts of intense exercise, you know, a quick, you know, fast movements or anything that for you would be a burst of intense exercise. Um, this varies depending on ability as well. And tensing, and well, right now nobody is. Fit, I feel. <laughs> um, but tensing and letting go of muscles, you know, like even kids, you see them go like, you know, and then just, <sighs> you know, and just helping you get back to the, to the right now, you know, um, breathe with them when you're helping somebody else, breathe with them, repeat to them, um, tell them they are safe in this moment, there is no danger in this moment, you know. I'm here with you, you know, we're gonna, you know, I'll stay here with you and, and whatever, if somebody else, if it's somebody else. And um, an EFT is also great. Um, the, as the motion focus therapy throughout this month, we have been practicing this with Ezra. And, you know, you have to go through these um, snap out of, you can snap a picture of this, just so that you can remember, you know, like the, the flow of it and practice it, you know, which pretty much is you start with your fingers, you tap and repeat words of affirmation to yourself, like, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, you know, and then I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. And you continue throughout different uh, points in your body. So for today's first exercise, um, we're going to get into breakout groups and someone, if someone in the group, if you don't have a facilitator, can volunteer to be a person having an anxiety or panic, you know, and another person volunteers to be, in, be the responder that helps guide them through a grounding technique, you know, once you're done. You can popcorn it to others or switch roles. And we'll go, we'll do this for 15 minutes just so that a lot more of you can help practice this in front of other people and just become more comfortable. So that when or if you are ever in that moment, it's not the moment that you pick to start practicing. You know, you've done it before, you've seen it done before. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're practicing and we're just learning together. So to better get used to it. So we'll come back in 15 minutes and if, and, if, and if your group doesn't want to do role plays, you can just discuss grounding techniques that uh, 
and share skill in that area, but we'll do it for um, 15 minutes. Hi, am I in your room? Are we oh. on this together? No, I, I think you, Ziggy, I think you're supposed to go to your room. Did you see it? I did not get a room. Yeah, I didn't either. Oh, here, let me, let me. Okay, now I'm gonna. Other people I uh, came later. I'm gonna. It'll take a second. I'll, you'll be added. with another facilitator for like, okay. Shout us to my breakout room. And um, so on that note, um, thank you for everybody that shared and participated and so on. We are gonna have um, a crowdsourcing, a Skillshare where we can hopefully, you know, everybody has so many different ideas and so many different types of triggers and, you know, these moments, you know, so, and solutions or grounding techniques to help you know, better, better deal with these moments. And if anybody would be interested in sharing your knowledge and just let's make a Skillshare link where anybody can go in there, get ideas, you know? So for example, here, like one of the things I love to do is, you know, walk out and just go look at my succulents and I'll get more and now, you know, do a little and, and specifically, you know, my succulents, I, I, I don't know, it just helped me a lot. Or, you know, the whole, you know, touching your rosemary leaves and tapping them to get that scent going. So it's a two for one, you know, now you're tapping your rosemary leaves and you're smelling them, the scent, you know, and we love in our house, you know, to put music on, you know, and it helps us, you know, when we get those moments of anxiety or panic or, you know, whatever it is that we're going through at the moment, um, snap out of it. And I know that different people play different types of music and so on. And those can be things that in our communities we do, you know, like um, I also have a bottle of whipped cream in the fridge and I'll go and be like, oh, well, you know, a little taste of that, the sweetness will help me, you know? And just any other technique that has worked for you, that's worked for someone you love that we might not have access to that information. Drop it in the in the Skillshare. You know, we would appreciate it. We'll put it together and have it so that anybody else can get in there and and try it out. You know, sometimes I also feel that um, when you practice the same one, for me, it eventually stops working at 
sometimes. So I'll have to get something new to like refocus and get myself grounded. And that might be going on with other people. So I just got a few ideas in a breakout room. So like, thank you. And if we keep sharing with each other, then we'll just have a bigger collective knowledge. All right. So just to recap, you know, healing is often a spiral and it feels like one is going backwards, but one is actually progressing at the same time. And remember that regardless of where a person's mind has taken them, you know, the rapid response is to safely guide their minds back to the safety of the present moment. And if you have any further ideas or resources to additional information, you know, like drop it in the crowdsource links or in the chat, we'll put it together and have this uh, so that everyone can access it and you guys can come back and look to it and get yourself some ideas from it as well. And you know, just practicing it. So when or when those moments come or when you have to help someone, you know, you're you have a better understanding and more practice at it. So thank you. We're going to have a little break right now. And before we get into our longer presentation. So we'll resume at 210. Um, we'll now be getting into a little bit of self care, communal care, and POTS. DJ, we have a DJ for today. <laughs> we'll kick it off with how to build our self care baseline check, get into some strategies. Our our interpreters here? I don't see them. Okay, based on check. Yeah, we're here. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, get into some strategies from us and hopefully you too, you know, we all share. A uh, recap on triggers, a uh, mini break for our self care, and how to transition into a communal care in POTS. So it is important to remember and so easy to forget to take care of ourselves during these heroin times. The work responders do is stressful, emotional, and draining. Keep in mind that no matter who you are, you cannot pour from an empty cup. Again, you cannot pour from an empty cup. We're better to others and for others when we see to our well being as well. And self-care looks different for everyone, and there is no wrong way to practice it. A good rule of thumb is to pause and check in with yourself throughout the day, do things like, you know, deal with things like hunger, dehydration, loneliness, and fatigue. Um, that way, they'll have less of an opportunity to sneak up on you. Daily check-ins are a good habit to get into because keeping track of our state of being is a way to regulate emotions and stress and which then leads to more effective outcomes in anything we do. So before you get out there as a responder to others, you know, breathe, take a moment and give yourself a physical, emotional and spiritual baseline check. A baseline checks are like checking that you have everything you need before a takeoff or in a race and, or whatever else that you might need, you know. You can create your own baseline check lists so it better meets your necessities here are some examples of questions you might have on there like have i eaten have i hydrated when was the last time i had food water you know have i slept have i allowed myself time to rest have i gotten up and moved my body at all um, have i cared for my body hygiene have I checked in with my body? Am I cold, tired? You know, do my feet hurt? Do my feet, my hands hurt? Um, emotionally, you could be like, have I spoken to someone I love today? 
have I tended to my relationships, um, humans, pets, plants? Um, have I done something that brings me joy today? Have I laughed? Have I told myself what a badass I am today? You know, have I reminded myself that I love myself today? Have I taken a mindful break? Have I practiced some grounding techniques today? You know, or and spiritually, you know, have I taken actions towards whatever your goals might be? Um, have I tended to things that give me a sense of purpose? Have I engaged in things that fulfill me? Have I gotten some fresh air, some sun time, seen nature? Have I gotten fresh, you know, have I practiced relaxing my thoughts, done some meditation? Have I expressed myself today? Journaling, storytelling, coloring, praying, whatever works for you. You know, don't see the idea of taking care of yourself as a waste of time. Go back for that sweater so you can stand in solidarity without suffering through the coldness. I've seen it, you know, um, and potentially getting sick. Get that water bottle or snack instead of marching with a grumbling tummy. I've heard those too. You know, like make sure that, you know, take care of those baseline needs that you have. And as you check your baseline, check your communal care baseline as well. You know, do you need help meeting any of your needs? Have you practiced asking for help? Do you know of organizations that could help you meet your needs? If you couldn't get that water bottle, can you ask somebody to bring you an extra one? You know, it can be very basic things that we really sometimes forget to do for ourselves. And, you know, we need everybody out there, you know, to just take care of themselves so you can continue doing the important work that you do. So here are some of um, examples or strategies that, you know, people do to try to meet those basic individual baseline needs that we have, you know, just love on yourself, um, you know, do the 20-20-20 rule, which is pretty much Every 20 minutes, look away from that screen you're looking at, at something that's 20 feet away and just hold your eyesight there for like 20 seconds, you know, like sleep, eat, hydrate, um, brush your teeth, take your meds, your vitamins, you know, go for a walk, read a book. Um, you can take hot baths and showers, you know, people eat chocolate or do, you know, like, um, roller skate, you dance, you know, here's this mini list um, can help you meet some of your self care needs. Um, and because everyone practices self care differently, we encourage you to check out the crowdsource link and drop what are your strategies to meet your personal needs and just give other people ideas. You can follow the QR code for that as well. So don't forget that the link is also in the chat. Yes. Thank you, Andy. So don't forget that uh, responders are also the people who need support, even as you support others. Supporting others in crisis can create crisis for responders. So many first responders already experience depression and PTSD, among other things. So we need a self-care plan to be able to continue doing the work in a sustainable way and to ensure that all needs are addressed in a crisis. So once you got your baseline ready, you can work on being aware of your triggers. You know, throughout this month, um, the trainings that we've had in the previous Sundays, hopefully you have gotten a better chance to think about what are your triggers and the actions you can take to help reduce the impact they might have in you. This isn't as fun, you know, as the hot chocolate and the bubble baths, but it is extremely important part of your self-care plan. So as a quick recap, here are a few self-care tips you could practice as responders, you know, um, be sure you're doing crisis intervention as a team, be aware of your triggers, you know, figure out how you will address these triggers before you are triggered, recognize when you are in a heightened state of emotions, be clear before you intervene of the level of risk you are willing to take, you know, and assess this risk before you intervene. Um, be aware of the of your resources before you go into a situation. 
Um, be aware of the limitations that you can do. You can't save people as a reminder, you know, you can't respond perfectly to every situation. You're doing so much by offering support as best as you can. And we are grateful for that. Be aware when you are not in a position to support others and when you need a break and some self-care, even if it's just going to the restroom and giving yourself a hug or getting some water. Figure out the process to separate your life from crisis intervention and refer to crowdsources, you know, Google Docs for ideas and resources that you can practice and use for help, you know, don't be afraid to um, just ask for help. And remember to review the crowdsource compilation link that's been posted on the chat and you can also review the previous trainings, you know, for more tips, ideas on how to prepare yourself as a responder. Um, so I know I see the chat, the crowdsource is already on there. So, so warning, you know, oops, warning in the next breakout exercise, we will be building a self care plan using scenarios regarding one of the following suicide, family trauma, school deadlines, COVID boundaries. So um, you can snap a picture of this if you can um, for yourself and for the self-care breakout. We're gonna do this exercise in your group, whatever your group number is. If it's easier, you can just go to that um, scenario and practice that, or we'll be answering two questions regarding your scenario in an effort to identify your self-care needs as a responder. The first one is what would you need to do in advance to prepare yourself for being able to emotionally handle the scenario? And what could you do afterwards to care for yourself? So in these um, groups, the exercise is not how would you respond to the person in crisis? It's what would you do to care for yourself specifically? So what would you do to prepare yourself beforehand? Um, in order and for something like this and then to what would you do afterwards to help care for yourself and each facilitator should have these ones that you can pick one but I'll also cut and paste and put them in the broadcast and we will be in our groups for 15 minutes.
So um, self-care, our second part, we have covered so far our self-care baseline as individuals and some strategies for that, you know, gardening, music, et cetera. And now hopefully we've identified some of your self-care needs as a responder to someone else, you know? So let's start a rapid response self-care plan for yourself. First, you know, answer, what are the needs you can anticipate regarding an event or situation? You know, list the needs you identified in your small group right now. Secondly, we identify if each of these needs um, is a physical, you know, emotional or spiritual need. Is it a community need? Do you need help? You know, you can label, sort each of these needs so you have that you have identified pretty much for better organization. Um, and then start figuring out who can help you support these needs identified. List resources to help you, helping out is a team effort. And I love that in our breakout room, like there was ask help, ask help came up a lot. Um, so take your time reformatting and adding on to your plan of self-care. And remember re before running out to help someone else, take a deep breath and practice your self-care plan that you Uh, I accidentally muted you there. <laughs> oh. So yeah, so pretty much, um, yeah, like uh, figure out, you know, who can support you in this needs and list resources to help you, you know, helping out is a team effort. And, you know, I know we had a lot of help come out in our, in our breakout session. And I believe we have time, Andy says, to jump into the second part and go back to a breakout room and then start, you know, figuring this out, like start a rapid response self-care. You can do it on a piece of paper, just take notes or even just brainstorming right now. But ideally this is how we start off a self-care plan. Oh, oh, Cindy, I meant that when we get to the pods workshop. Oh, we could add this. Okay, oh, okay. okay. So we're going to continue then for this one. Sorry, there's a little. And here's a, also a, a website. You can snap a picture of this if you want to just further like see this in another different format and read more about it. So we're going to take a little break right now um, because as the grade... Audrey Lord says, caring for myself is not an act of self-indulgence. It is yes. self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. So let's take a five minute break, do a little self-care, stretch, hydrate, go snack on something, whatever it is that you need. And this could wait five minutes and we'll be right back. So we'll resume at 2.50. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who has better music than I do, please share. We have a DJ in the house, apparently. Oh, I got music. Okay. Oh, wait. Juan, I said he was going to DJ. No, no, you got it. You got it. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Hold up. Let me. Will it? Hold up. It'll let me just play music from my phone, right? Because that's all I have. Okay. okay. If you can share your screen, awesome. you can do it. Okay. I can't share my screen, but. Hold up. Um, you get a mute. I got. Wait, do y'all hear it? Hold up. I, I, I switched to you so you could share a screen if you want. Oh, thank you. In like the share screen settings, there's a um, uh, like a button that you have to click about sharing your audio with it. Okay. Okay. Got you. And mm -hmm. cause yeah, cause that's not sometimes. Okay. Got it.
What? What's happening? Ziggy, if you want to just tell me the song, I can play it from my Spotify. Oh, okay. Is it not playing? Man, I keep trying to play it. Okay. Uh, Hola Senorita by uh, Matwe Jim and uh, Maluma. Shit, can you type that? Sorry. No worries. Yeah, I'll type it right now. All right, just sent it. Thank A few more seconds, so a few people step back in. Andy, are we? Are you good? Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. So let's continue. So as we continue building on our self-care plan at a greater scale, we must transition to communal care as well. So how do we transition to and from self-care to communal care without it hurting your ability to do either or? Well, first off, we practice self-care to the best of our abilities. And when you feel comfortable, you start adding people to your caring practices and circles. Many of us um, have already started practicing communal care. If you've ever helped someone else or cared for someone else in times of need, if you've supported people, groups that uplift the social well-being of the community, if you're here today, this is an example of communal care or got to know your neighbors, it's all communal care. Getting to a place where we can create more of these practices and being able to better recognize how much of this can be done by each individual person without burning out is where many people might need help and practice. So we got our self-care ideas as an individual, right? Like how we started then as a responder, we start identifying what our needs are. And now let's transition to building as part of a community, not just an individual. Let's start thinking about and build a baseline for communal care while holding, you know, your individual self-care, you know, um, as an important aspect of this communal care. So we can start asking by asking ourselves questions and planning for and what capabilities can you care for others, you know, effort, time monetary, you know, we know capitalism has taken over a lot of, you know, self care, the um, things. Sometimes we can jump into practicing communal care with more people than we can handle. And although many people thrive in building community with many people very quick, you know, to others, this can be overwhelming and can cause burnout. Um, this could make us lose confidence in our ability to build community around ourselves. And But let's not forget self-care in our approach to communal care. So self-care, you know, first and foremost, make sure you don't forget that you are part of the community. And taking care of yourself is a revolutionary act. You know, um, responders are, you know, a foundation of communal care. And many times we forget to care for ourselves. So 
I have this little diagram. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> so once you get that down, you know, like just making, caring for yourself, identifying your needs and you're checking your baseline. And now you start, you know, thinking about these questions about communal care and what is it that, how can we do it? It's not a race and so on. Slowly start adding to your communal care circle. You know, add people you want to build community with. This could be one, two, three people. You don't have to start with a lot of people. And as you become more comfortable with your expanded communal care circle, check in with yourself. This can take weeks, months, sometimes years. And if after your self-care check, you can add and want to, you know, if you can and want to add more people, then go ahead. So the way I saw it is, um, you know, we're like little seeds and we start caring for ourselves and we start growing and we bloom. And then, you know, we're able to help more little seeds grow and bloom and so many and those seeds can help more little seeds grow and bloom and so that's kind of where the the pictures image goes um so if you so remember always before you add more people check in with yourself then go ahead and try to help somebody else and then you know and ask for that help back and just keep it going you know and as you continue you know you can continue checking in and so on, you know, um, don't forget that you're also helping others build so that one, two, three people, you know, five plus more, who, how many it is that you're comfortable and okay with, you know, that you're building communal care with, they can potentially be helping others build other circles and so on. It's like a ripple effect. Once you have someone in your communal care circle, there's a lot you can do to strengthen your relationship and build that report within each other. Um, when you check in with yourself, you could check in and on them too. You know, you can send them affirmative words of action, uplift them, remind them you're available to them. You can share resources, information that is beneficial to them. If you have available time, share with these people, you know, help with errands, voice, video chats because of COVID right now. Go to a rally gathering, you know, or those when we have those <laughs> social distance picnics, um, when things get better, volunteer with them, you know, and when you feel good, spread the joy to them, play together, cheer them on. If you have the monetary resources, you can share with them masks, hand sanitizers, you know, gift cards for food, etc. The hard part is when you feel bad, you know, ask them what they do to feel better in similar situations. Their answers could help you and just practice asking for help with them, you know, like these, these are your, your groups. Um, and you can, even if it's for small things, just start practicing asking for help. Keep repeating this along with your other self-care um, strategies that we've been talking about. And give yourself credit for investing the time and effort to learn and practice building communal care. So as you work with your circles and strategize to continue nurturing these communal care circles, you can take it further by considering a pod. What are pods? Pots come, um, the word pots are just this theory. Pots come out of the Bay Area's Transformative Justice Collective, who use the term pot because the concept of community can be too abstract to create true accountability. Um, for a lot of people, community means a lot of different things. So they needed a better approach to it. In a pot, you would have people that you will call on to support with things like immediate and ongoing safety, accountability, and transformation of behaviors, or individual and collective healing and resiliency, as written by Mia Mingus for the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective. So how do you create your pod? First, you can start by identifying a group of people who can support you if you are harmed assist you in being accountable if you cause harm and be there if there is support 
you know, as your support if there's a crisis. And you don't have to have the same pod for each group. You might have one pod for if you're harmed, one pod if there's a crisis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Pods can be made up of anyone you trust and have a relationship with. Um, in a pod, you're not limited to those who are close to you, either physically or because they're my family or wise or anything like that. These people should then be aware of each other and know they can act as a team because they are part of your pod. Pod members can be identified both individually and collectively. So if you have a group of people you have good report with and are in constant contact with, such group could become your pod and you just have multiple members at the same time or found multiple members at the same time. Pods are most effective if you build ongoing communication and trust with them as a team. This can be done through any platform, through group text, online, in person. And for further information on the Bay Area's Transformative Justice Pods, you can check out their site through the QR code. You can snap a picture and, or go, through, go to their website. They have a more in detail of the pods. So another type of pod that you can consider creating is a crisis pod. This would consist of a group, of, a group you can call in case of an emergency, generally nearby geographically. Everyone in this pod would have a form or a packet with vital information such as, you know, addresses, emergency contacts, medical information, anyone in the pod would need to advocate for your emergency. Um, emergency gear, individualized needs, et cetera. In your crisis pod, members go through each person's form or packet in detail to better understand what areas of support are needed and they would think through what the emergency response for that person might be. Crisis pods also identifies any resources or trainings that may be missing to enable an emergency response, you know, CPR trainings or um, just getting more transformative justice information or it's important that these pods check in regularly as a group to normalize the group response. So again, it's practice, just practice getting comfortable with it. So when the emergency comes or if you're ever needed to respond, you don't start practicing then. You've practiced before. So for our exercise on pot mopping, for this exercise, you can practice mapping out your pots. As you start your pots foundation, address issues and concerns that you might have in mapping your part, your pot. If you have a pot, what have, um, what have been some challenges that you can share for others to pre-plan? If anybody here has already started POTS or drop any tips in the crowdsource or share it in the chat, we'll put them all together. So for this exercise, the big corner circles are your resources, your network communities or groups and organizations that could be resources for you. You know, um, like CAT911, BATJC, other cohorts you might be in, um, other transformative justice groups you might be in, you know, so who could you ask into your pod? So in your groups, I guess, oops, sorry. you can um, ask questions like, who could you ask into your pod or move from the middle to the inner? Do you have a pre-existing formation already that could become your pod? What challenges do you face, you know, on creating a pod? Uh, do you feel awkward asking others? You don't know how to ask. And, you know, what they found um, up, in, up in the Bay Area was that a lot of people didn't even have one person that they could contact. So in their communities and so on. So maybe through pod mapping, they're able to find somebody that's not necessarily who they think would be in their community circles or community care circles. And learning to identify that. So that's part of our planning for our self-care pod mapping. What support do you need to address these challenges? Where can you get help for that? So create a plan to address reasons that could interfere with building your pods. So and for this uh, small group, um, since you probably won't have time to actually plan out the pod, but what you could discuss is 
what challenges would you have in creating a pod? <laughs> and then how could you address those challenges? Mm-hmm. Or if you already have a pod, what have been the challenges you've had in keeping that going? You know, and how would you address those? And in addition, um, some people have said that they didn't have enough time to fully discuss the scenarios in the last small group. So if you want some time to do that, you can continue that discussion. So we can go a little bit later than if we're going to include this, those discussions. So maybe we'll have 20 minutes and I will get the, our, our, so are you ready for the group? Okay. Should I, okay, so I'll, let me get the breakout groups going. I also sent a question, Cindy, um, that I, w- I would love for you to address. Um, thanks, Sue. We'll, we'll go through all of that when we come back. Yeah, so great. Okay. Some questions about, uh, you know, what if you don't want to bring people from different areas of your life together? Um, so people have thoughts on that. Um, one one suggestion I found is, again, sometimes instead of thinking of finding, say, five different individuals, think of a group that's already kind of together. Like maybe you're on a soccer team or maybe you're working with folks and you're already got a group chat going. And then it's, then it could just be a lot less difficult to mobilize them because they're already used to working with you as a group. And I think the the your pod doesn't have to be your five best friends. And sometimes maybe that's not always the best people to be in a particular pod. So it might be easier to thinking, is there a group I'm already connecting to? We're already on WhatsApp or whatever. (laughs) We're already checking in on this other business. Can that group potentially be one? Then that's already a group that's already in the same area of life together. And they're already used to working with you as a group and they know each other as a group. Sorry. Yeah, any other questions or thoughts? Um, Andy, I just wanted to share that because um, it was coming up around this awkwardness of asking people um, and also um, maybe having less resources uh, to, to support and to support one, you know, to the balancing, um, the, the reciprocity, reciprocity, I guess. Um, and I think that, you know, we, it's important to always be mindful, I think to, I guess, be self-aware first and identify like what, what it is, you know, what we can offer you know, in terms of support, um, you know, and maybe we can be, maybe we can cro- concretize some examples of that. Um, and, and that can, that can change also, that, mm-hmm. that can change also if we have different abilities. Um, and the other thing is around capacity and just naming capacity, you know, uh, what is capacity meaning, you know, how much time, how much, you know, know, uh, emotional space too, you know, do I have or can I offer at this particular time? And And what I was bringing up is that that changes too, you know, so right now, I have way more emotional capacity um, to support um, folks in my pod than at the end of the year. Um, At the end of the year, I was just, you know, I had to let everyone know I'm not, I'm really not available at all. Um, And, um, but now, you know, I have, I have way more. Um, and, And then I just also wanted to share that it's lopsided sometimes. Sometimes it's lopsided, and and I think it's important to just acknowledge that. Uh, hopefully, folks aren't keeping score. Um, oh, I did this for you, but you didn't show up for me, and you know what? I wasn't able to, but 
you know, um, I'm mindful of that. And, um, you know, this is what I can do, you know, uh, but, but really figuring out like what, what is the support that, you know, one can offer. And if, um, you know, any of the facilitators can, can give good examples of that. Um, like I can feed someone's cat, you know what I mean? I can, I can feed an animal. I can, I can pick up a kid from school. I can, um, I can pay, pay bills, you know, for someone, um, a bill, not, <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, I found um, the key to this is that it's a team that is a t operates as a team rather than five distinct individuals. Because that's where I think you tend to end up with the, those issues. Like I can't help this particular individual. Like if you contact five individually, they'll all maybe have something that they can't, you know, that they can't do at that time. But if you contact the group as a team, <laughs> then the team who knows that they are your team can figure out amongst the team who can step up. Right. So, so that's why I, I felt like developing a team based response is often most effective. And also, I don't think this requires like having to get super deep right away. Like, let's say if you already have a group you're meeting and you just once a week text, say, how are you doing? And you say, I'm OK. <laughs> but it's more you just have a regular kind of communication that took two seconds that starts to normalize just being in communication as a team. So then at a point when you need an emergency, it doesn't feel awkward because you're used to that group text or you're used to that group way of responding. So that's what I found helpful that allows for people to more easily support as they can, <laughs> because if it's a team, does that mean since it doesn't require each individual person to step up at a particular moment, the team can figure out who has the capability. Um, I don't know if other thoughts and Penny was on staff. Did you want to offer some thoughts? Yeah, I did. Um, I I just wanted to say, like, I really appreciate the comment on it being lopsided, and um, and like, I, I just feel like that's okay sometimes. Like, and and this idea of reciprocity kind of being um, something that's been like shaped by our upbringing is like, it everything has to be like an equal give and take. You know, and um, as much as, you know, I think everybody, you know, should have what they need and everything, you know, so if you have more capacity than someone else, it, you, it may be lopsided and just like being okay with that too. I just wanted to add that. And Sarah? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say, I really appreciate your comments about like the usefulness of having a team approach to pods. And for anyone like where that feels like inaccessible or like, you know, like it, connections are easier with one-on-one -on -one and like the, the forming a like kind of team like that doesn't feel possible just that I've had great success with having a pod that is individuals and it requires a little bit more like coordination on my part when I need care to like coordinate between folks, but it has for me been like very effective. And when I have been in crisis, like have really been able to like activate my pod, even though, even if they don't necessarily know each other. So another option. Can I just ask Thank you so if, much for sharing. Can I ask oh, something? Sure. sure. If, is anyone willing to concretize some of their experiences? Because I think we're speaking, you know, very abstractly, and sometimes the pod just it just feels very vague. And so, if somebody okay. could just say, you know, just give a a real life example of something that happened, if they feel comfortable sharing, that would be great. I can give two examples because um, I have two different, I have more than two pods, but one pod, like again, because I felt shy talking to people, but I was already in this cohort and I just, and we had a, a weekly, we were always on WhatsApp and talking about other stuff. And I just said, by the way, could you all be my pod? <laughs> and they said, sure. And so I just check in them with them normally, but like, for instance, I had an issue come up and I just said, hey, can some of you be on a call with me to help figure this out? 
not everyone could do it, but most people could. And they helped me come up with a plan for how to deal with the issue. And that was pretty cool. So they, and other people had a similar thing. So we had a crisis and they're like, can some, can some of you cheer me up? So we kind of respond as needed. And I also have a crisis pod that got happened through a group I was already working with. We were already on and get a chat. And then we just started talking about COVID and said, well, what happened if somebody needs to get to the hospital? We don't want to call 911. So we just got together. We created a, uh, like as, as, as discussed, a, a form for each person, what each person's needs were. And then we went through each plan. Like if something happens, what will we, what will the four do? <laughs> so we developed a whole system and the same thing. We just check in on chat once a week saying, how's life? Like no, no deep, we don't, have, it's not a major time commitment, but just to get, have us used to contacting each other should a crisis happen. So those are a couple of examples, but also uh, um, before I turn it back to Cindy, if you go to the crowdsource document, uh, please um, uh, add any ideas, brainstorm things on uh, pods uh, in the crowdsource document and check the chat, someone's interested in a pod. <laughs> Bay Area. So um, yeah, you could add that too. If you're interested in creating a pot in a particular area, feel free to share that too as well. And back to Cindy. <laughs> Thank you everybody for sharing and for your comments. And um, yeah, and um, if it's okay, I want to share in our group. Um, we also touched a little bit on uh, that, like our personal experiences and so on. And just for my, in my experience, um, I think I thought I had a lot of pods, but in reality, I just, you know, had different community circles and, and so on. But when COVID hit and the pandemic and, you know, we were separated, we really took a mental health toll on our inability to see anybody. And, you know, like just being quarantined and, and not having that communication. So it, it kind of ended up turning into a pod um, of like, okay, we are all gonna be holding ourselves accountable to making sure we we all double mask when the double mask thing came in or making sure we all, if I found masks, then you know what, I'm getting masks from my pots and sharing them because I'm able to afford them right now, you know, or somebody else has a big thing of hand sanitizer, we, we share, we this, you know, and we all started keeping ourselves accountable of like, you know what, we're gonna get tested and such a date and did you get your test or you know did you get this or if you were exposed do you do we all know the information like as i was updated throughout the, the time of the pandemic you know and we would share it with each other and because of that you know it at times we were also sharing there was somebody there's people in my pod who i hadn't known for so long you know and our pod isn't big it's small but it, it was incredible how sometimes the people that you think were going to be there, you want it in your pot, are not the people that are going to be in your pot. And letting go of that, that was huge for me. Like, but I want that one person I love in my pot during the pandemic because, you know, they would be with me in my zombie apocalypse team, but they, they're not. So just accepting that and knowing that it's not necessarily, you know, who you are closest with sometimes. And it's more of like, who do you trust? You're trusting, you know, with big, deep issues. In this case, you know, it could be our lives, our family's lives, you know? And we had been able to like have a social distance picnic and there's no arguing about, I don't wear my mask blah, 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 or nothing like, no, it's just, we all just, we stay accountable or if we come across, you know, we bump into somebody who was an anti-masker or something along that way, right? It's just, you know what? I need to make sure that I take the measures to know that I'm safe and that I'm gonna keep my pot safe. And even if that means that, you know what? My, this family member that I love, I'm gonna have to distance myself from you because for this crisis pot or the, for this emergency pandemic pot that I have, my commitment is to protecting them because I know that their commitment is to protecting them. And if you, somebody I love is putting me in danger, then I need to make sure that I have, you know, my self care on top and, you know, and my pods and my community and so on. So it's just building upon that. And it's a lot, it's like a lot of layers 
and just I guess once we start thinking about it I feel very lucky that I started trying to build a little community circles and so on many years ago because or else I don't know how I would have just been able to jump into that right now with the whole pot and the emergencies that we went through this year but start small you know another thing I shared was that um I started by literally one day like you were sharing right now like some mom um, that I just needed a break and you know what and just me I'm, I need to take care of myself first so I went back to zero I reset and then I started thinking okay if I have the energy what's who's that one person that I know needs my help and we can help or I can help them and so on and then who else am I willing to share that energy with and then who else and slowly I started building back up instead of like help everybody a little bit I felt like it turned into help a few a lot and I've seen it create more of a change within those people I see them now being able for them to help other people and I'm like whoa it's kind of like the same amount just I don't do it by myself I do it as a team but yeah thank um, you everybody for those conversations Cindy I think Hannah had a question oh okay Hi. Oh, I was just, I just wanted to add my um, kind of another somewhat concrete version of putting a pot together from my experience. Um, um, and also, I'm just realizing that uh, a lot of us talking about pod mapping is coming from the perspective of, you know, building the pod for ourselves, um, which I think is really good. But one thing in, that happened in my experience once is I was a primary support person for someone going through a mental health crisis and also going through like an accountability process. There was a lot of things involved there, but um, what ended up happening is we were talking about the different people that they were in touch with and kind of, this was before COVID, but um, I ended up being kind of introduced to like one person say, uh, and we like slowly built this pod and ended up like meeting as a group and talking together um, and then had a group chat as well. Um, and then, um, so that's, I don't know, one, one way of going about it when, when we're not social distancing, I guess. And um, uh, another thing that comes to mind is um, someone mentioned in the chat a while back when we were just talking about this, about trauma bonding. And I just wanted to say that that note really resonated with me. Um, I think also it's good to note that you're not always going to stay in the pod, maybe beyond a crisis um, because of that sometimes. And so, um, yeah, but thanks for letting me share. Thank you. So anybody else that would like to share these perspectives are, are really, are really good for us to think about and just get that you know those questions and all that going that plan also i want to add that for people with um a lot of anxiety and sometimes ptsd or you know who suffer from panic attack mapping and you know like knowing what what the plan would be in case of an emergency and having those answers those questions answers beforehand, it, it really helps as well to reduce that level of stress sometimes to have that folder binder with all the things you would need in case of an emergency. Some people, it really helps for them. So I guess I'm moving on another layer for, you know. Oh, I have a. Go, go ahead. Like something. I'll oh, see. You said like, um, other people who might have perspectives that might be helpful, like personal pod mapping stuff. Mm -hmm. are, are, are we still doing that? Um, uh, we're yeah, starting yeah. to run out of time. Oh, yeah, please share, Ziggy. Um, for other folks, I'm just going to add the link here since we're starting to run out of time for the session. So um, I'll add the link in again. But I yeah, think please share your ideas. Too. So I think we're. we're Okay, um, well, for me, me and my girlfriend, we like sat down one day and we were like, hey, let's make our pods together. 
because we knew that we were both going to be in like the first most innermost layer for either of our pods and so we wanted to be talk through making the pod together and be aware of everybody who was on the other person's pod and get a copy of the other person's pod and so then what we also like to do like not every single person on my pod is part of the same community or the same group or knows each other but you know all the people that are on the same level like you know I'm I'm trying to have no one person be on that level without knowing at least one other person on that level and sometimes just do like you know community bonding sessions just with everybody from that level like hey what up intermediate level of my pod let's chill or what up innermost level of my pod hey you know so just like it's like a patchwork for me of like a bunch of different pieces of community of my communities so like nobody's there without knowing a few other people there but nobody there besides me is close with everybody there if that makes sense yeah and and that that is i feel like that in a way it's also also with our communal circles and so on and for the crisis pod in particular that's for whatever that crisis is and that's okay like like again remember like there's no wrong way of us to meet our self-care needs or whatever it is that so um thank you for sharing that Siggy. and uh so for our last slide for this you know um another layer of this you know self-care and you know then as an individual as a responder and then building into community circles and so on and then more in depth you know situations like pods and, and crisis pods and we have also harm reduction community mapping um so briefly i guess um mapping it's um, it's it's like a one last layer of self-care or a greater layer of self-care mapping at a greater level. Um, and it has similar principles as pod mapping, but done in a geographic scale. In this format, you map resources, individuals, neighbors, organizations, and stores in a particular area. Um, it involves talking to everyone in that particular area in order to map out who can be a resource be able to identify areas of specific concerns, and then you can develop strategies based on the, in the information that you're gathering as you build this community mapping. Um, for further resources on harm reduction, community mapping, you can check out um, CAT911's neighborhood program, um, madqueer.org, Vision Chain Twins, they all have like, a, they're working on community mapping. And so you can just go around where is it maybe the neighborhood that you live and so on if there was an emergency you know hey this place is really helpful for this and this place around the corner for this or even like a let's say a basic scenario when if there was a crisis in, in, or when we had our lockdown and where do we get water and some people are just that one place that they go and buy water and there was no water there but there's so many other little stores and so on. And we started having to figure out where are other places where we can even find these basic needs. And now during everything that happened during the pandemic, you know, we are working on, let's not just get our things from Amazon, right? Let's look for local, local businesses and mom and pop shops and help them out and spread the wealth and, you know, and so on. So yeah like mutual aid is so important yeah so that's pretty much you know like community mapping um briefly and we're gonna stop here and thank you let's have another five minute break remember our collective power is immeasurable so drop your you know if you have information resources that you would like to share you know let us know let's have another five minute break um, practice some self-care, go to the restroom, break, stretch, get ready for our last training of the month and the most fun and probably very interactive one as well. Yes. So we'll, we can resume at 3.55 and All whoever right. has good music, feel free to share. 
Hands rare, DJs. 10 minute break then. Oh, no. Thank you. Actually, why don't we resume at four? Why don't we resume at four? All right. Give All it a, right. Give a longer break. So Ten four o'clock it everybody. is. <laughs> Thank you for your. Okay, so. Um, uh, Oops, wait, I see what the problem is. I'm spotlighted, hold on. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we begin, I uh, just wanted to mention, since I'm doing this, I can't monitor for the wellness room. So if you need the wellness room, then directly DM wellness Claudia. Um, that you should be able to see uh, if, you, if you would like to access the wellness room. Okay, so uh, in the self-defense class, um, if we were to really do this, I would say it would be minimally about uh, six hours. So what we're going to do here is we're not going to, we're going to be able to scratch the surface, but hopefully what this would do is give you a foundation by which you could develop your own individualized self-defense plan. So what we're gonna cover in this section is what I'm just gonna give kind of a framework for how we can kind of understand self-defense. Um, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about kind of common pitfalls I think that happen when we think about self-defense. Um, then I'm gonna go over some principles <laughs> that can be used to figure out your own self-defense plan. I'm gonna then uh, show some basic strikes uh, you don't necessarily have to do these strikes but I'm gonna provide these as examples that might help you figure out what you would wanna put in your repertoire. <clears throat> and then we'll have a, a small group a discussion to kind of develop self-defense uh, skill share discussion. And then we'll start to wrap up at the end. Okay, so uh, self-defense, uh, well, we've talked a little bit about the hyper-professionalization of mental health, but I think the same thing happens with self-defense. There's a hyper-professionalization and it gets equated with only a few people with uh, martial arts training can do this. And then all the moves are so complicated, you can't remember it. Excuse all the Cobra Kai references. You'll probably hear from me today because I just got through season three. But this kind of creates an image of self-defense involving being a high level of athleticism and being very able-bodied um, that can feel kind of difficult to attain if you don't find yourself in this category. Um, but I used to do community-based self-defense classes and I do actually have a black belt in martial arts, but I found that martial arts isn't actually the same at all as self-defense. And I studied many self-defense classes and I concluded that it's important to kind of democratize this information and figure out how to be able to share it um, so that it's, it's something that we all have, we all have this information, right? It doesn't require a black belt in martial arts to, to engage in self-defense. Um, so we do have, uh, if you're interested, we do have a four-week class um, that kind of goes from self-defense to community self-defense. And it's kind of designed not just to teach it, but to teach people to teach it. <laughs> like it, 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 it wouldn't take too long for anyone to learn how to be able to teach self-defense, not just to take a class. So if that's something you're interested in, CAT 911, uh, please do contact us. But this will, this will be a little bit of a taste of that. Okay. Okay, so um, anyway, some of the, here's some of the kind of basic pitfalls I often see when we think about self-defense. Uh, first of all, there's often a kind of a thing, if I know enough self-defense, I should be able to get out of any situation, right? And this can create a very survivor blaming attitude, right? But why didn't you fight back harder? Why didn't you do this? Right? And it can also make self-defense feel a little prescriptive, right? Like if you learn this technique, you're somehow obligated to use it. <laughs> And this is just not the case. Like there's been people with all sorts of trainings and weapons or whatever who still got attacked, right? There's nothing that can protect you from every situation. But also there's not like a moral obligation to have to do it, right? So when we teach these um, uh, strategies, uh, think of them more as tools for your toolbox. And it's for you to decide if you want to use them or not, right? Uh, if you, if you, use, you do it, and also, if somebody's under an attack, there's really no one who can second guess that situation. Like you're in that situation, only you can decide. Right? Um, so these are tools that you can decide whether or not you want to use at that moment. 
and only you can make that appropriate decision. Okay. Um, somebody, oh, I see. Sorry, I'm trying to manage the thing while teaching at the same time. Okay, second thing. <laughs> on the other side, though, sometimes we can have a fatalistic attitude. Well, you know, there's no way I can fight back, right? It, it's not going to work. Somebody's always going to be uh, stronger now or something. Right? <laughs> so that that is also not the case. Um, there's been studies that have shown that three out of four people who are facing a sexual assault, for instance, if they fight back, they actually get away from the situation. So you can actually fight back. And the reason is, and this gets to the next problem, is that self-defense is not martial arts training and it's not even primarily fighting. <laughs> it's, you're not trying to be a better fighter than the other person. You're just trying to get out of there, right? You're just trying to use your quick and dirty move to get out of that situation. So you can defend yourself successfully without being a better fighter than someone, without being stronger. To give you one example, there was one woman who was elderly and she was also had two prosthetic legs. And someone broke into her house and took off both of her legs. Right? So she was not in a great position to fight in this particular case. But what she did, was, I, should trigger, I should say trigger warning, that in this discussion, we will be talking about um, uh, stories around uh, of, of violence. But in any case, um, she basically grabbed his testicles and squeezed them so hard that he passed out. And she was able to crawl and get assistance. Right? So that's an example where it wasn't a fight. It was her using her resources <laughs> you know, her strengths against his weaknesses. And that's what self-defense is. It's a different kind of uh, 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 mentality, okay. The other thing, and so therefore it's not, self-defense is using your tools, whatever tools you may have and making the most of them. The next thing I wanna mention is sometimes we tend to think all we need is our mace, mace and pepper spray and we're good to go. And I say, if you have something that's gonna work for you, awesome. But it, I've often find, find that it often works against people if they are reliant on one thing. Because what if that thing gets knocked away from you? Or what if you end up getting sprayed, right? Then people are like, what else do I do? <laughs> so I suggest that to the extent that you can, you want to at least have your body be a weapon, like a body be a thing that you'll be able to defend yourself with if possible. And if that's not possible, at least have four or five other things besides your paper. <laughs> pepper spray or mace, right? I think there's a tendency back to the self-defense industrial complex to want to create an industry around, uh, around this that's about capitalism more than it's about uh, empowering us to be able to, to fight back ourselves. So we often get sold if we have this one thing, that's the one thing that fits all. But instead, we want to have several tools in our toolbox, and if at all possible, to have our body be one of those tools that can help us defend ourselves. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, so yes, if, if you're interested, I saw several people said they were interested in individual collective self-defense training. Uh, if you want it for your community, or if you would like to train people to teach it, uh, particularly for your CAT teams, then just give us a little email there. And next slide. Okay, so I did. I want to briefly mention some of the legal principles. Here's some more trigger warnings because evilness is about to uh, unfold here before us on these slides. Um, but there's always a difference between what the law says and what the law actually does. So the law says um, California law allows you to use force in self-defense when you reasonably believe that you are in imminent danger and force is necessary to stop the danger but you can only use a degree of force reasonably necessary for that situation, right? So if someone's trying to steal your box, uh, your, your bike, then you're not entitled to hit them over the head with a hammer, right? It has to, the force has to be appropriate to the situation itself. And in terms of your ability to defend others, it's the same as if you were facing the same situation, right? So if someone is stealing my bike and another person wanted to help me, they could use the same force necessary as if their bike was being stolen. However, the law is often doesn't do what it says. And in particular, the, 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 the problem tends to be the reasonable person standard, right? It's like, what would be reasonably necessary? 
And juries will judge that based on their own racist, sexist, ableist, and otherwise problematic prejudices in terms of what they think is reasonable. So to give an example to the next slide. So Anthony Simon shot and killed his neighbor in a completely unprovoked attack. Uh, his claim of self-defense was that because his neighbor was Asian, he must have known martial arts and he was acquitted on the basis of self-defense. Meanwhile, Peggy Stewart was systematically tortured and beaten. Her life threatened many times. Her children were abused. So she kills her husband in self-defense to protect herself and children, and that was considered to be unreasonable. So this is something we always have to keep in mind in terms of self-defense is that uh, people are going to be treated differently when they uh, when they argue for self-defense. And while this is beyond kind of the scope of our conversation, in the next slide, there are some more resources if you're interested in this in particular. Um, no Self to Defend has in, uh, important information on kind of uh, the racialization of who is allowed to claim self-defense and also Survive and Punish um, works for, uh, as an organization that supports criminalized survivors of gender violence who were um, criminalized for fighting back. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna go into some basic principles and we're gonna get a little chance to do stuff if you feel so inclined. So uh, the first one is trusting your intuition. Well, this is what we're, we're usually told, trust your intuition, right? If something seems off, go with that rather than saying, oh, I'm just making this up. Um, I think that we do have to refine this principle that is often used because Again, our own prejudices can inform our intuition. <laughs> so I think one thing to consider is like, what if, if a warning bell is going off, what is it? Is, there, is it something the person is actually doing or is it just who that person is, right? And what we're gonna talk about more particularly is um, uh, the, a big warning sign we want to look at is if someone is overstepping their boundaries. Okay. So that's our first principle. Second principle we want to talk about is using our most powerful weapon if we are able to do, and that is our voice. So in an attack, we can often maybe do a high pitch, ah! but instead what we want to do is convey power. We want to kind of breathe deeply with a low roar. So instead it'll be something like this. No! Now, why do we want to do this? Well, for one thing, uh, it it uh, can scare off your potential attacker. <clears throat> Two, it can uh, create more attention so people see what's going on. And three, if you are fighting back, uh, when you yell no, you know, when you fight back, then that will actually make your punch more powerful. So we're going to here. Andy, um, you seem maybe you were getting a phone call or something, so we were hearing a very loud ringing. Yeah, it sounded like. Oh, oh no, I didn't hear anything. Is it okay now? Yeah, like Can you hear me? yeah, but go alert. back a few sentences. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even hear it. Okay. Yeah, okay, so I'll back. Are you okay now? Can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, okay, so sorry. So uh, again. Back to the principle, we want to use our most powerful weapon and we want to yell, kind of yell, no, right? So what we're going to do here is on a count of three, uh, we're going to, oh, is that the machine? Also, my heater's on, so maybe I can turn that off. In any case, on a count of three, if you feel so inclined, uh, feel free to take off the mute if you'd like, you know, yell no. One, two, three, No! no! No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Another one. Another so, one. you want to do it one more time? Okay, sure. Ready? One, two, three. No! <laughs> okay, good job, folks. So, um, so if if that feels uncomfortable to you, that is okay. Uh, it's not something that was comfortable to me, but it's something you can practice, right? And. Uh, in fact, all of these things may not feel comfortable, but if you practice it, like in the privacy of your own closet or whatever, yelling no, 
eventually it's, it'll start to feel more comfortable. So whatever feels uncomfortable is cool, but if you keep practicing, it'll start to feel more natural. Okay, the next principle we wanna talk about is being aware of your surroundings. Like look around what's going on. Is there a safety plan? Is there someone looking suspicious? Is there, is there, some, is there a place you can go for help? Like being aware of what things are so you can respond accordingly. And then with that, looking at danger. Um, Maggie, are you here? Yeah, I'm here, Andy. Oops, hold on, let me pin, someone pin Maggie. Andy, you ready? Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay, okay. It's show time. So, yeah. So You're what so we want to talk late. about is the... Okay, can everyone see Maggie? Because I, I don't know what's going on with my view that I can't see anything. Okay, now yes, I can. we can okay, see awesome. Maggie. Okay, great. Okay, okay, awesome. Okay, so what we want to do is often when someone is following you, we have a tendency to get nervous but not look at the person. So we will, Maggie and Siba will de demonstrate what we often see. Go for it. <laughs> Right, so exactly. So we were looking and we might be like kind of nervous, does that make sense? But we are not looking at that person. And that's just not make sense because if that person's dangerous, you wanna be able to see it, right? So we'll try this again and this time looking at what's dangerous. Go ahead. Right, so again, if you were to look at it like me, let's say someone's following me here, right? <laughs> I want to look right at the person, look right at the person and be ready to respond. It might feel awkward, but even just looking directly at the person can, can scare somebody away, right? Um, in fact, there was one uh, time when uh, somebody was attacking other people, was, I think it was in Chicago, and what they were doing is they would go up and look at the person in the eye, and if the person looked down, they attacked them. If the person looked back, they did not, right? So this now, did the people who look down do something wrong? No, right? You have the right to look wherever you want, but looking directly at them kind of sent a message to that person that said, hey, I'm not, go I'm not going to bother. <laughs> so, so looking at danger, if you sense danger, look at it directly so that you can respond uh, accordingly. Okay, the next principle we wanna talk about is establishing and communicating boundaries. <laughs> so we're gonna have, Okay, so what we'll do is like uh, Maggie will get uh, get 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 farther away. Is that like a comfortable space? Okay, can you back up? Okay, so now get super close. Where it's kind of too close. Okay. Okay. So you might have boundaries with some people. You they can be farther away, and some people can be closer. So Maggie's gonna walk in, and as soon as you get too close, just say stop. Okay. So wait, wait. When I come, okay. Right. Stop. Okay. Okay. So this is the boundary here, right? Now, if Maggie was twelve foot three in green, Maggie might have to be in another state. Right? Someone else may be even closer. Like you have different boundaries with each person, but you want to be aware of your boundaries so that you're prepared to act when someone oversteps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, there are three different ways we tend to uh, react when someone oversteps their boundaries. So, uh, Maggie, can you just pester me like you're at the bus station asking for the, the time or whatever? Uh, can I get that time, please? It's uh, 12. Uh, you sure? Yeah, yeah, fine, yeah. Uh, you didn't sound sure. Can you look again? <laughs> okay, so here's an example where, right, I, I'm kind of, you see, I'm leaving my space. I'm feeling uncomfortable, but I'm not actually telling Maggie to do anything, right? I'm, I'm just letting Maggie kind of take over my space. So if you, uh, would you like to demonstrate that? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, hi, can I get the time, please? <laughs> can I? Hello? The time. time is um, 4.21. Uh, okay. So now if someone acts more passively, does that mean something's going to go wrong all the time? No, right? There's many times when you don't say anything and nothing happens. But the negative part about this is that if someone's over, many times the way attacks start is someone starts by, they test you by overstepping their boundaries to see how you react, right? They test you to see, are you going to defend yourself? So if you don't assert yourself, you, you may be conveying to that person, hey, this person may not fight back. So, so that can be the danger part of not asserting your boundaries, right? Now, another possibility can be a more aggressive approach. So Maggie will try the same thing. If you want to just, ask, for, for me, ask me the time and that kind of thing at the bus stop. Go ahead. Oh, would you? I mean, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, excuse me. Can I get that time, please? I mean, Back off, what the hell is wrong with you? Jeez. <laughs> okay. Now, what are some of the positive thing about this is that an aggressive response you know, might scare somebody off. They may not be expecting it, depending on the particular context. But the negative side of this is, one, it can escalate the situation, right? Like you're putting so much energy into it, it can, it can, it can, it's more likely to can lead to an escalation. And then three, um, you're not, you're still, you're not still conveying a sense of power, right? You're, I'm not even saying what I want that person to do, right? Okay. Andy, so yeah, go ahead. Um, people are asking the time, which is 4.23 PST. Um, and also, mm -hmm. are we having any more breakout rooms today? Uh, we might, depending on the time, if we can get through this. Okay. But the, the session ends at five, right? Okay. We will not, uh, we will not go over, never fear. Okay. <laughs> okay. So instead, what we want to think about is uh, how can we uh, communicate? Uh, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> How can we communicate boundaries firmly and calmly in a way that's less likely to lead to escalation? So the principles we want to think about is just stating what it is, the boundary is, not leaving your space, and not getting into a discussion about the boundary. You just state what it is over and over again. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Nag, if you want to do the same thing for me again, the time. With you? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Excuse me, can I get that time, please? It's four o'clock. Um, you, I don't think you really checked. Back off. Come on, it's just the time. Back off. Really? Back off. That is so rude Back of you. Off. Uh, okay, Back off. I'm just, okay. So uh, the idea here is that do that make sense? You're, you're stating what you want. You're clearly stating what you want that person to do. <laughs> you're stating it calmly and you're not arguing about it. You're not getting into a discussion about it. You're just stating it. Now, depending on the situation, you might communicate things differently. Like let's say someone's like a coworker and they keep putting their arm around me, right? I, it might be something like this. I'd be happy to talk with you, but take your arm off me. And if he keeps doing it, take your arm off me. Take your arm off me, right? Uh, if you if you feel like you need to give a little explanation, like maybe you say one thing here, I'm not comfortable with you putting your arm around me, but I'm happy to talk with you. But then take your arm off me. <laughs> Just stating it over and over again because there's not there's not um, uh, there's not, it's not a thing to argue. Right? Uh, one way you can think about this is uh, Maggie, are you still there? Okay, so um, what's the what's the food you hate? Um, I don't like liver. Okay, Maggie, would you like some liver? No, I'm good, thank you. But I, this is very delicious liver. No. But I cooked this liver all night long. It's gross. No, thank you. <laughs> all right, like you, you're like. If you think of somebody gives you food, you're like, you don't feel the need to explain yourself. It's just like, no. Uh, or, or maybe you do feel that way, but there's going to be something like that that's just like, Andy, do you want to go to yogurt land? 
no, <laughs> it's like I'm going to Pinkberry, right? There's just not an argument about this. So think of that thing for yourself. It could be a food you don't <laughs> like or whatever that you're just not going to have an argument about it. It's just, this is what it is and this is what it is. So this is kind of the general uh, principle that we want to think about establishing and communicating boundaries. And you might often find that just doing this <laughs> itself can stop a lot of situations, right? It can stop a lot of situations just by clearly and uh, effectively communicating boundaries. And then finally, our last principle that we wanna discuss is planning ahead. As I mentioned before, some of these, uh, like fighting back may not always feel comfortable, establishing boundaries might not feel comfortable, yelling no might not feel comfortable, but if you practice it just a little every day, like maybe two minutes a day in the morning, <laughs> and just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, it'll start to feel more comfortable. So planning ahead and practicing can make uh, the difference. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, I, heard, I see this about uh, collaborative self-defense, so we'll talk about that briefly. We won't have as much time today, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. Any other um, uh, questions? Okay. If not, um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, show a few strikes that you can try um and Sorry, again I, go ahead there's a question will the self-defense stuff be a collaborative effort but yeah yes yes i'm going to talk a little bit about more more of that at the end but i won't be able to get into communal self-defense quite as much because of the time frame okay. but i'll talk about it at the end okay so i'm going to show some strikes and if you would like to um uh um, uh, try some of these things, uh, feel free to do it. I'll just give you kind of the basic mechanics to, to do this. So anyway, the first strike is gonna be an eye strike to the eye. Um, so the, the things you wanna think about is get two fingers and your thumb together, right? Not just your fingers, cause it's gonna, you could kind of break your fingers easily. So you wanna reinforce the fingers with the thumb. <laughs> The next thing you want to do when you stretch is you don't want to just use your arm strength. I'm going to bring this down a little bit. You want to put your hips into it. So you can think of it as putting your feet kind of a, a foot width apart with one leg in front of the other. And you're putting the hips into it like this. Does that make sense? Because <laughs> I'm, so I'm getting the whole hip strength so that my strike is harder. And that this is just a general principle of putting your hips into it for any kind of strikes you would do. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is, no, no, no. Okay. If you would like to try it, wanna get up, you can keep your uh, video off if you don't want to, but if you wanna try it in the privacy of your home, or you can take the mute off if you wanna try it. Uh, we'll do three strikes, okay? We got our thumb with our two fingers. We're striking the eye. We're getting our hips ready to go. And we're going, no, no, no. <laughs> Great. Okay. So the next strike we're going to try is the elbow strike. Now, when we think about fighting back, um, like we're, what, our, our principle we're thinking of is what are my strengths against their weaknesses? Like I'm not thinking I'm going to go punch people, do some spinning kicks and all sorts of other things. Right? <laughs> I'm thinking of where are they vulnerable? Like their eyes, the neck, right? the nose, potentially the groin area, depending on the circumstances, although people often think to protect that, the knees, right? I'm thinking of where are, are the most vulnerable areas. And then I'm thinking of what are my uh, strongest areas? And a punch is not that strong, right? Uh, an elbow strike is gonna be a lot stronger. So what we wanna think about here, when you do the elbow strike is having the same pose, but you don't wanna just use your elbow strength like this, right? You wanna reach forward, then strike. Does that make sense? So reach forward, look behind you so you know where you're hitting, and then strike, right? Okay, so if we can, I can't get the video to be perpendicular, so I'm trying my best here at this time. So try, so again, it'll look like this. No, no, no. So you all like to try that again? Put your feet apart, 
Uh, had the arm move forward, look before you, and three elbow strikes. No! 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 <laughs> okay. So, the next, the next, the next uh, uh, um, strike we're going to try is the knee strike. You can imagine this. Here, I could see this. Try not to slide on this thing here. So one way to think about this, this is actually true for the strikes too. Whenever you're trying to hit something, don't aim for the surface. Aim for six inches beyond the surface. <laughs> and with the knee strike, okay, you, what you don't want to do is just strike and come back. Right? That's not going to be as powerful. Instead, you want to think you're going to go through the person. So it's going to look more like this. No! Right? So the knee strike, when, after you do it, your foot's going to end up behind, in front of you, not back to where it was. Does that make sense? So I'll do this in slow motion here. So I got my feet to the same power position. But when I strike, I go forward. Right? Like you think you're kind of going through, mowing the person down. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna try this if you want to. Pass through and just do one knee strike. One, two, three, no! Okay. Like I just got my whole weight propelled forward. Moving forward can't be stopped. Okay, the next one, a simple strike, it's just a basic stomp, you know, like stomping with, the, with your foot and your heels. Uh, this, you might be stomping to the, the, um, your, someone's foot. Or maybe if someone's knocked down and you had to stomp to the head if necessary. Um, but again, you're just stomping down. So it'd be, no, no, no. Practice some stomps here. We'll try that. One, two, three. No, no, no. Strike. Uh, I, I always try to include one strike that's very debilitating. And this would be if you're kind of in more of a life or death situation. Um, so it's not something you would do to kind of, you know, unless that was kind of that situation. But this is called the leopard paw. And the leopard paw is a strike to the neck. So it is potentially uh, uh, lethal. But if you're in a die situation, it might be a strike that you might need. <laughs> so here's the principle of the leopard paw. So let's see. OK, take my hand, right? Instead of getting into a fist, right, you're only bending the first knuckles. You see that? And you see my hand and wrist are totally flat. You don't want it bent like this. You want it completely straight. And you're using these knuckles. And because when you hit very hard with a small surface area, it's going to be that much more powerful, right? So it's, and again, you're going to use the same dynamics as the finger strike where you're putting your full weight into it, like and you're putting your hips into it. So it'll look more like this. No, no, no. So if you'd like to practice that again, take your hand like this, move the first knuckles only. Oh, keep your thumb to the side. Don't let the thumb be like this. You don't want it, because you don't want the thumb to get broken. So you keep the thumb to the side like this, mm -hmm. like this. <laughs> So you have your knuckles, you're not bending your wrist. You're just keeping your knuckles like this. It's flat as a board here. And we're gonna count to three. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, so what we're striking here is you're striking the neck. The leopard paw would be ideal for a neck thing and if you're trying to, uh, you're trying to have a debilitating blow. Now, when you look at these strikes, depending on your abilities and other inclinations, these may not be the five strikes you would want to use. <laughs> I present these more as an example. But the principle, what you're trying to think about here is, what is something simple that's not hard to remember? If it's some kind of complicated flipping around thing, you might likely forget it in a, in a pressure situation. Um, the second thing, is that you want to think of what are a few things that will work in a variety of uh, situations. So like, for instance, let's say somebody got me in a chokehold, like 
vision somebody's got in front of me with a chokehold, right? <laughs> and the chokehold, you can't breathe, so you're thinking, how do I break the chokehold? But actually, in the chokehold, that person's weapons are tied up, but yours are free, right? So all these, most of these things you can do, you know, eye strike, eye strike, stomp, stomp, leopard paw, leopard paw, right? You want, you're thinking about what are a few things that will work in a variety of kind of circumstances. Okay. Um, there are many more things we could discuss, but uh, this is an example. You can do your own research, look at strikes, look at what feels comfortable for you, think about the variety of situations and see kind of what will map onto a lot of situations. So as a thought for kind of developing your own self-defense plan are, think of five or six simple moves that work for different vulnerabilities and work for you. <laughs> And they might be different. Like maybe if you uh, can't punch, but maybe, let's say maybe you're in a wheelchair, your strike might be bam somebody with the wheelchair and hit them with the cane, right? So whatever you have, think of what are five or six things you think you can work for, for your purposes. Then try to practice full force. <laughs> um, you can do it in the air like this or get a pillow, or if you wanna take it up a notch, <laughs> You can go to like a martial arts place, get like a little shield here, have someone practice hitting things. There's also this uh, kicking shield if you're interested, where if you can, if somebody holds it and you can practice kicking against it. Whatever works for you, but you want to practice full force. You don't want to get in the habit of practicing against someone else and then pulling the punch, right? Because then you're not going to have that body memory of what it feels like to go full force. So think of five or six things, practice full force, and just do it two or three minutes a day, right? You know, like you can wake up in the morning and just go, eye strike, eye strike, stop, stop, elbow, elbow, left, you know, just do that. Even, it doesn't have to be hours. It could just be literally two or three minutes in the morning. But if you do that, it'll start to become part of your body, remember. That happened to me one time. Um, I, someone attacked me. And I just been doing them so much, I didn't even have to think of what to do. Like I immediately responded without even thinking about it, just from having done it, done it so many times. <laughs> and then as I mentioned before, use your voice if possible. Every time you strike, you know, and practice using your voice when you're practicing. No, no. Do that yelling your nose. So I suggest doing that. And then when you get to the point where these five or six simple moves you feel like they are part of your bodily memory, right? You feel like they're just kind of part of what your body knows. Then you can maybe add a couple more strikes or add a couple more moves. And once, once they're integrated, then just keep adding more to your repertoire. Again, these won't get you out of every situation, but it just gives you another tool for your toolbox if you ever need it. <laughs> okay, any questions so far? Okay, so again, we didn't have as much time to talk about a communal self-defense, um, but uh, in the four-week class, that is focused more from individual to communal self-defense. But an additional resource I want to share is Vision Change Wins thing. And again, if you want to do um, figure out uh, communal self-defense in your particular area, again, this is something we can, can co-create together. We can share the curriculum that we have, but can, as with everything can be adapted to your particular needs. Um, is there any questions so far that I, I, it's hard for me to see the chat. Is there any questions I'm missing? There was a question about um, if you were striking with second carpo. carpo? Yeah, yeah, you're striking here. So it's all, all the knuckles together are hitting the, the, um, the, neck and, then, and why why are we doing that instead of a punch as i mentioned because when you have a smaller surface area it's a much deadlier it's a much more powerful it hurts a lot more so that's the idea of doing the second carpal also because the neck's a smaller area so it gets in easier but also it's going to be have a much bigger impact if it, you hit with a smaller surface area and i guess that has a question else? um mm -hmm. Will the self-defense training registration be sent out to the list or do we need to directly email to participate? Oh yeah, we don't have a set class. This is just an offering if you want it for you. <laughs> Does it make sense if you want it for your particular area? Just let us know and we can figure, uh, get, uh, get that um, 
connected for your particular local team. Could okay. we send um, a DM to the Instagram account or only email? Uh, email will probably get less lost. So I would probably suggest uh, emailing would probably be best. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I think we have a little time for small groups. So what we would, we would be discussing in the small groups is like, one, how do you imagine creating your own kind of self-defense plan? What would that look like? And we also have a document here where you can share your own self-defense because I'm sure many people have experience and you have great strategies, ideas, strikes or whatever that you would like to share. So we can add that to the Google Doc. Um, but also we will have a little time to share, like how do you imagine creating your own self-defense plan? What might be some challenges? How might you overcome those challenges? But also since we're coming to an end, uh, we'll have a little time just to, if you want to, you can just debrief how the training was for you as a whole. Okay. So we won't have as much, well, we could, we'll probably have about um, 12 minutes or so. So uh, I'll send a two minute warning though when we uh, run out of time. So let me find the breakout rooms. Okay, so we will uh, start the rooms now. Hello, everyone. We are near the end of our time. So if you have questions, we will um, answer questions at the end of the session. And also please go into the chat to the self-defense um, skill share if you have any ideas or strategies for self-defense that you would would suggest for everyone else. Um, but to conclude, kind of the overall principles we want to think about in self-defense is that you don't have to be a big martial arts expert, super athletic or anything. It's about using your resources to the best of your ability to defend yourself. Um, and so the first thing we want to think about always is uh, communicating our boundaries calmly and effectively. And most self-defense is actually not about physical contact at all. It's about avoiding that through the effective communications of boundaries. So we wanna state what our boundary is clearly, calmly, and just state it over and over again without getting into an argument. We don't leave our space. We have the other people leave our space. The second thing we wanna think about again is practicing. If things feel uncomfortable in terms of establishing boundaries or saying no or fighting, uh, the more we practice, the more it will start to become more natural. Um, I had one friend who uh, was very shy, and she's also very small and petite, and she did not feel comfortable doing most of these things. But uh, she ended up having to be my assistant for the community-based self-defense classes. And before you know it, she's out there telling guys twice her size to back off, and they're, like, running off because she's just so assertive and calm and being able to assert her boundaries. So... Even if things feel uncomfortable now, if you practice it just a little bit a day, just a little bit, it'll start to feel more natural for you. And then finally, again, when you think of physical techniques, you're thinking of what are a few strikes that are simple, that are not too hard to remember, um, and things that will work in a variety of situations, and you just practice them again and again full force. Again, even a couple minutes a day will start to put it into your body memory so that you'll be able to use it if you want to. Again, all of these resources are not things you have to do, but it's just one more tool for your toolbox that you can use if you so choose to. Um, so again, thank you for joining us today. Um, please fill out the evaluation, which is also in the chat. Um, that will cover both uh, today's evaluation as well as the full week's evaluation. Uh, as I, we have mentioned before, you will be getting sent um, all of the links to the videos, all the links to the PowerPoint, and all the links to all the crowd shared documents. Uh, feel free to use them as you wish, adapt them, change them, whatever, because um, the goal is just to get this knowledge out to the community as much as possible. And if you have feedback from your experiences, please share that back so that we can kind of collectively learn together. Okay, so we want to kind of end with, um, uh, we've been saying no a lot, <laughs> but we're going to end with one big yes, which is, you know, we want to say yes to all the hard work we've done, yes to our power, yes to our amazingness, yes to our ability to protect ourselves, yes to our ability to keep our community safe, and yes to our ability to change the world. So 
On a count of three, if you want to unmute, cool. If not, that's fine too. But we'll just count, uh, yell three on the count of three. One, two, three. Yes! So for those observing this video, you will see we didn't have the ASL interpreter. That's because I forgot to pause, take the pause off. But I did want everyone to see what the last part of the section was, so that's why I went over it again. But anyway, all you out there watching this, have a great day, and we look forward to working with you all as we create safer communities for ourselves and the world. Thank you.